All right, team. It's time for some notes. So, ready? Yeah. All right, figure out how you want to take your notes. If you want to do it on computer, if you want to do it on paper, that's fine. Um, one of the things that, okay, backtrack. I have selected a lot of scientists, and hopefully you guys have chit-chatted about the different scientists you were researching. It was very intentional, the scientists that I selected. And in fact, the reason why I selected those scientists was because it was recommended uh, on a workshop that I watched over the school holidays about the standard. And that's where I got this idea from. Um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind about this standard, I'm just trying to think how I want to phrase it. Okay. I also had a lot of time to think about the standard and what the requirements are for these standards. Uh, I want to talk about scientists for two reasons. The first reason is that uh, for this internal assessment, you will need to have observational data to prove the interactions and the interconnectedness between the human body and the pathogens. So you need to have scientific data. We can, connect, we can collect that scientific data prim, through primary methods. So primary science is where you guys do the experiment, you collect the data. They will also accept secondary data for this internal. Secondary data, you guys okay? Yeah. yeah. Secondary data is when you get data from the internet and you use it for your report. So it's not your data, but it is still data. Both of them are acceptable on this internal assessment, which is good. So if you're doing a virus, we're not going to be able to do anything that's primary data virus-wise because viruses cannot be grown in a high school setting. It is very, very dangerous to do that. It's also very, very expensive to do that. So primary or secondary data. So it's important to talk about the scientists for one, or for one of the first reasons to talk about these scientists is to make sure you understand the collection of data and what does that data mean and how can we use that data to prove our understanding of things. Are we good so far with that first point? Yes? No? Okay. The second point is that one of the things they stress at the workshop is that we want you to understand that when we are thinking about this assessment, and let me just get the notes down. Okay. It's going to be a general kind of assessment thing, and then there's going to be talking about various people. Okay. So for this internal... What we need to do is we need to think about an environmental factor. Now these environmental factors, they can be probiotic or abiotic. It's not probiotic. Biotic or abiotic. Now, you guys have had some lessons on this material so far. Now, the easier one to do is the pro of the abiotic factors. So what are some factors that affect uh, life and if life can survive? That is a non-living factor. Do you want an example to start you off? Temperature. Yeah? Water. For example, if you dehydrate something, it won't be able to survive. pH, for example. All right? I'm just going to write et cetera because I don't want to go through the whole list, but that just gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. Yeah? Okay. Biotic factors are living factors, so living competition. So, like, for example, if you have a food source, that is a biotic factor for most animals. Unless you're a plant and you're getting light, you have to eat another animal or organism to get food, to get nutrition. So food as in nutrition. Um, another thing you have to think about is something like, is it being prey? Is it going to get hunted? And also competition with other living organisms. With other organisms or resources. All right, are we good so far with those kind of ideas? I don't even know if I spelled competition. Let me grab that. Yeah. 
You know how you can spell some things when you type it, but you can't spell it when you handwrite it? Does anyone else have that? Yeah, I forgot it. Oh, I misspelled that. Does anyone else have that problem? I can spell better when I type than when I can handwrite. Competition. All right, keep going. Okay, so those environmental factors, they will influence the life processes of the microorganism. I don't think that is an effect or effect. So this affects the life processes Right, life processes of the microorganism. So like, for example, if the microorganism doesn't have access to food, it will die. If the microorganism is too cold, it won't do its cellular respiration. Does that make sense? Okay. Now the other thing to keep in mind is that there is an interconnectedness to everything. So the life processes of the microorganisms, and I probably should have centered this a bit more, will affect the environment. So for example, if the life process of that organism produces waste that's harmful, then we have toxins being released into the environment. All right, so that's what we need to think about. Turning on my notes. And the big word for this topic is interconnectedness. So we're seeing how all these things are like intertwined together. And human impact people, same with your standard, it's very focused on the interconnectedness of the Earth systems. My notebook. So the big idea is the interconnectedness. No space. Interconnectedness is going to be a really big, important thing. If you're aiming for excellence, that's something you really need to be thinking about. How are all these things intertwined together? It's a really complex system. All right, can I move it? You guys need another minute. Another minute? Okay. Cool. All right, let's think about these scientists then. So I, uh, I picked these scientists for a very particular reason uh, because what they have discovered has really contributed to our understanding of microorganisms and also our understanding of germ theory. Uh, they're basically the fathers of microbiology, are these uh, scientists. And unfortunately, I am saying fathers because they are ma all men. And unfortunately, they were all white men. Um, but it's not to discredit, obviously, other cultures and the science that they have done uh, because they did have some understanding of we need to cook our food so we don't get sick kind of thing. So 
And for this is just all that we have currently as kind of the mainstream knowledge that we know that we are aware of, but everyone, all humans, it's part of our human nature to do science. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. All right. One of the things that's pretty crazy when you think about it is that, let me backtrack. Okay, so microorganisms was a really kind of foreign idea back in like the 16, 1700s. That's when this idea started. So basically, we didn't realize that they were things that are alive that we can't see with our, without our naked eye. So we just thought life was as it is with what we can see in front of us. And it's actually a far more complicated than that. So there was a group of people that were focusing on the whole, the microscopic world. So that's one category. The other category of people were trying to understand why do people get sick. It took us until, uh, what is it, Koff, who it was born in 1843 and lived until 1910. That's when we discovered the link between the two. So let me work you out on that. So we had the first idea was microorganisms. So that was one school of thought. The second school of thought that we had was, why are people getting sick? That's the second school of thought. Now, it's crazy for us now in the modern world to think, why do people get sick? We know it's because of microorganisms. There's a direct link, yeah? But that took a long time for us to figure that out. Back in the day, they had some crazy ideas to explain why people got sick. And the example that I talked to some of you guys about um, in our last lesson on Tuesday was that they believed that people were sick because of bad blood. And they would literally drain you of your blood. They would stick you with leeches to clean the blood and thus cure the illness. We know now that that was not how it worked. And let me add, white people were doing that. So... <laughs> So they think they know everything. They had some crazy ideas. Um, anyway, so let's go through the timeline. First thing that we're thinking about are looking and understanding that microorganisms exist. The first one, sorry, the first two people that did that, there was Hook. And the other person is Le Wen Hook. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I know that was a lot of people struggling with that. Lay when hook. Alright? Hook was between 1635 to 1703. That's when he lived. Lay when hook lived from 1632 to 1723. So that was those two people. They both worked with microscopes. Um, Hook looked at larger organisms. He was putting things like bee stingers and like leaves and plants underneath the microscope. Um, so he was looking at kind of like stuff that you could physically kind of hold. Um, he basically was the one that coined the idea of a cell. Because he said they looked like prison cells. Huh? Blurry? Fixing it. So he got the idea of cells. He got the idea that there is a micro world uh, and what we can see. Uh, when the hook, he also had microscopes, but he had better microscopes. And so he was able to see squiggly lines. So he was the one that found bacteria. And we all know when we're thinking about the size of stuff, cells, a plant cell is very different from a bacteria cell. So he was basically looking down his microscope, and he saw these like weird little squiggles. He'd be like, oh, I see that little squiggle, and it's moving. I see like this little weird squiggle that looks like that. He saw things like little things like that. So he saw all the shapes, basically. So he saw shapes like that because he was looking at bacteria. Hook, on the other hand, was looking at things like cells, so he saw the bigger versions of things. His microscope was not as good, but he was seeing things like that. So they were getting two very bits of different, uh, very different bits of information, and I think back to that time frame, and like how crazy they must have sounded to be like, "Hey, buddy, guess what, neighbor? There's some weird stuff I see floating in the water." 
Like, that's crazy to think that. And it's like, oh, it's moving. Oh, I think it might be alive. Like, that was a mind-blowing idea there. So that's what they were working on. They were working on things very separately. Um, and the flip side, other people were working on the disease side of it. So one of the scientists that we talked about was Jenner. What did Jenner do? He discovered the vaccine for smallpox. So that's his time frame. So he figured out smallpox. Did he have any knowledge of the immune system at that point? No. So this was, again, something that, so when you guys think about your practice science course, you know how you're talking about the different scientific methods and different kind of techniques? He observed that the milk girls, so the girls that would milk the cow, they would get cowpox. He observed that they never got smallpox. So he was like, huh, that's weird. I wonder why that is the case. So he started taking the cowpox and using that to infect people and then found that they didn't get smallpox. Um, and in fact, I think he even tested it on his own son. Yeah. 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 So that was our idea. He didn't understand why it was doing that. He just understood that that was the correlation. If you can infect someone with cowpox instead of, they are then protected from smallpox, which is groundbreaking. So this opened up the world of vaccination to us. Um, we didn't understand how or why it was working, but we knew it worked. So that was that guy. All right, Semmelweis is another one. Semmelweis actually has a really sad story. Um, he was sent to a mental institution where he was beaten to death. And it's so sad, his story. Um, I don't know whoever did that one, but and if that was talked about, but he had a very tragic ending. All right, what did Semmelweis figure out? What do you figure out? Who did it? I'm going to start to get my charger while you guys are thinking about it. Well, let me figure out. Who did it? Who researched that scientist? Anyone? Someone? No? Not talking too shy. Okay. Semmelweis figured out that you needed to wash your hands. Yeah, he was hand hygiene. So, his story is really interesting. So, back in the day, um, you would have hospitals, right? And you have doctors. And doctors were, were held in a very high esteem. It was a very honorable job and profession. What these doctors used to do is they would go into the lab. Sorry, they would go into the morgue, which is where the dead bodies are. They would cut people open. They would operate. They would look around. They would try to figure out why people are dying of cesspits, which is like a blood-borne infection. Um, like why are people, they were looking at that stuff. And then what they would do is they would walk out of that morgue, they would go to the other part of the hospital, they would deliver the baby. They did not wash their hands at all in this process. Work with dead bodies that are infected, go to the baby, deliver the baby, wonder why mom died. That's crazy, right? Who does that? These guys, doctors, back in this time. So, that's what they were doing. And in fact, you had a better success. So, and Semmelweis was looking at data, and he was like, why are women who go to the hospital more likely to die during childbirth than women that don't? And then he observed that one of his colleagues cut himself when he was working with the cadaver, and then he got cesspits, and he died, I think is the story. So then he was like, why don't we just wash our hands? Something that we are carrying on our hands from the morgue is going to our, our, our birthing mothers and killing them. So he's like, let's wash our hands in between these two steps. So he suggested that as an idea, and he was ridiculed for it. He was ostracized for it. People were like, how dare you claim that doctors are dirty? How dare you claim that doctors are the cause of these women's deaths? They were. So he had a very sad life in a sense that they obviously butt heads a lot. People thought he was crazy. 
Um, he was put in a mental institution and he died there. Uh, I believe he was beaten to death in something. So he had a very sad life. All right, but that's what he discovered. Okay, next person. Is Pasteur. You might have heard Pasteur before through pasteurization, which is a really important process. So, and who did Pasteur? What did he figure out? No, that was another one. That was cough. This one discovered that you need to sterilize things. All right, so again, crazy things to think about back in the day. Back in the day, let's say you had a piece of meat. You left the meat out. The meat suddenly uh, made, like, grew maggots. You know what they thought that was? They called that spontaneous generation, that living things randomly form from non-living matter. Spontaneous generation, that was the word. We now know that a fly landed on it, laid some eggs you can't see with your naked eye, and that's been what's growing into maggots. So he came up with sterilization. He came up with the idea of let's sterilize things, let's treat it with heat and temperature, uh, heat, wash it, all those sort of things. Let's kill things in there. And I'll talk about how that means in a moment. I'm trying to be quick because I know we've got other stuff to do. Okay, the person that made the connection between these two ideas, microorganisms causing disease, So the person that figured that out was Koch, and that was 1843 to 1910. So he, he basically worked with um, penicillin, or not penicillin, with, um, with uh, oh, what's the word? Tuberculosis. So his research with tuberculosis had made them realize that these two things were connected. So we didn't know that was connected until him. Uh, and then the other scientists you guys uh, talked about was uh, Fleming. He's a fair bit after everybody else. 1881 to 1955. He was the one that found penicillin, which is an antibiotic. Okay? Now, the reason why I want to kind of point this out is I want to talk about these big, sorry, about the life processes and how it connects with the life process. So these two here are just trying to give us the concept of the cell. This one here, the life process that's interfering with the smallpox as an infection is going to be your immune system. Is the immune system a biotic or abiotic factor? Biotic because it's a living thing. It's killing it. All right, hand washing, you are removing the pathogen. Uh, pasteurization, the sterilization often requires temperature. So you're doing something with heat, uh, pressure, that sort of stuff. So this, again, or sterilization. If we think about hand washing, we'd also think about hand sanitizer. Uh, so that one removes water, which is a uh, abiotic. This stuff here is a abiotic factor that is affecting living organisms. This one over here, penicillin, it's produced by a fungus. Uh, fungus is basically competing with bacteria for stuff. So this here is an example of an biotic factor that's influencing pathogen survival. Anyway. That's all for today. I'm sorry I ran to the bell. But that's why we talk, talked about these scientists, so you can think about all those contributions. I'll scan this. I record it. It's all going to go online.